we know from Romans 11 that the first believers in Jesus were Jews. And we know the last believers will be Jews. If you want to put it this way, the first Christians were Jews and the last Christians were Jews. A circle. Revelation chapter 7 and 14 addresses this, among other passages. Isaiah alludes to it in the Old Testament, but the New Testament states it directly. Okay, it states it directly. It goes full circle. Jesus says directly. Three times, most of you know, he says directly, speaking in the first person, that the Jews would be restored to the land and to their ancient capital. Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. Pletheron, until something in the future has to happen in Greek. Pletheron, ad ethnon, Gentiles, ethnic. The word Gentile just means ethnic, nation. Um, Matthew 23. Matthew 23, we put the chapter division in the wrong place. The closing verses of Matthew 23, verses 39 and 40, are really the prelude to Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse. Jesus makes it clear that Jews must be regathered to Jerusalem for him to return and say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Zechariah 12, that Yossi spoke of today, they'll look upon me who they have pierced. Uh, it says it directly. Now, it's, it's very curious that something that Jesus has said at least three times directly. I'm not talking about what the apostles have said or things in the book of Revelation or, or the many things in the, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Just things that Jesus himself said personally in the first person. You get someone like Stephen Sizer says, we should not focus on those things, we should just look at the broader teaching of Jesus on things like brotherhood and social justice. <laughs> In other words, pick and choose, take out the bits you like, ignore the rest. How is teaching about brotherhood contradictory to the teaching about God's prophetic purposes for Israel? But it comes full circle, the Jews have to be back there. And there will be believers there when it happens, or leading up to it. The former rain and latter rain, God poured out his spirit. Isaiah 44, verse 3, the outpouring of rain, Geshem, is a picture of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, according to Isaiah 44, 3. The first rain that gave the first harvest was on the day of Pentecost. Okay. Hag Shavuot. But there'll be a second one. Peter, in his kerygma, quotes from Joel, chapter 2. None of that stuff happened in Pentecost. The sun was not darkened. The moon did not stop giving its light. There were no fire in the sky. Those things still have to happen. God poured out his spirit on Israel in the beginning of the age of the church, and he will pour out his spirit at the end. And to a degree, as Josie was talking about, it's already begun. It goes full circle. Now, we have a problem. The problem among Jews, believing and non-believing, is charlatanism, phonies, fakers. There are serious academic rabbis who are orthodox, but they're scholars, they're university professors. They will admit to the historicity of Jesus and the Jewishness of the New Testament. I'm not saying they're believers, but they're intellectually accepting of the Jewishness of Jesus and the New Testament. In this country, it would be Rabbi Haim Maccabee, professor. In Israel, it would have been Professor David Flusser, who was one of my wife's professors, and uh, Pincus Lapid from, I think, bar -Lan University. He wrote a book on the resurrection of Jesus, and he said from a Jewish perspective, the resurrection of Jesus is irrefutable. This is an orthodox rabbi who's a professor said it happened. In the United States, Emeritus Professor of Ivy League, that's like Oxbridge in America, Jacob Neusner, he says the Gospels are the pivotal Second Temple period Jewish literature between the early Midrashim and the Apocrypha. 
Now, these are orthodox rabbis, scholars. I very briefly met Larry Fishman from New York University, professor. He's on the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission. These serious scholarly rabbis all accept the historicity of Jesus and the New Testament. I'm not saying it makes them born again or believers. What a lot of them say is, well, he was the Messiah for the Gentiles. <laughs> that, that's the usual conclusion they arrive at. But these are serious, serious scholars. They're rabbis and professors. Geza Vermesh, Oxford University, from the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission was another. These are serious. But then you have Schlockhaus rabbis. Schlockhaus rabbis. Oi, the gospel, the goyspiel, it's all stuyot, it's all nonsense, don't listen to it, it's all crazy. The really learned rabbis don't say that. It's the less learned ones who say it. I've argued with rabbis, they can't argue from the scripture. When you argue from the Talmud with them, they can always find another Talmudic opinion. It's, they use a, a, an ancient form of argumentation called pill pull. It doesn't have to mean this, it could mean it just goes in circles. It's, it's what Isaiah said, line upon line, precept upon precept, give a little, there a little. There's no end to it. Now the fact that learned rabbis, serious scholars, do not dismiss the Jewishness or the historicity of Jesus and the New Testament, that makes a statement. That makes a statement. There have always been rabbis and Jewish intellectuals like this. There was a famous rabbi called Avraham Farizel. He said the description of the suffering servant in Isaiah 52 and 53 remarkably resembles Jesus of Nazareth. Among Orthodox Jews, that's a, he has a big name, Avraham Farizel. You have people like the Israeli author Ahad Ha'am or Martin Buber, the 20th century Jewish philosopher. These people all spoke favorably of Jesus as a Jewish figure. The chief reformed rabbi in Germany during the Holocaust, Leo Beck, spoke favorably of Jesus as a Jewish figure. It is always the Schlockhaus rabbis who mock Jewish believers and mock belief in the gospel narratives and, and dismiss Jesus. Oh, Yeshu, or the Goyspiel. You do not find seriously learned academic rabbis who will do that. It's always the Chabad, Lubavitch, or something like that. These are not really learned men. They're indoctrinated, but they're not learned. There's a difference between being indoctrinated and being learned. Roman Catholicism indoctrinates people with catechism. They're not learned. They're indoctrinated. Well, I'm sorry to say, among Jewish believers, it's the same thing. You have serious theological scholars, a tradition going back to Alfred Edersheim, to David Barron, up to the present time. Obviously, people like our friend Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Dr. Michael Rydelnik in the States, and uh, Daryl Bach from Dallas Seminary. These are Jewish believers who are theologians. These are serious scholars. Serious scholars who have credibility in what they say. But then you have the Meshuganahs. They practice something that is a mixture of hyper-charismatic Christianity mixed with something called Yiddishkeit. Yiddishkeit is diasporic Ashkenazi Jewish culture. It's not modern Israeli culture. It's not Sephardic culture. It's not Yemenite culture. It's certainly not biblical culture. It's one expression of Jewish culture Based, it was based on Yiddish originally. <laughs> it was the religion of the, it was the culture of the shtetl, of the ghetto. Fiddle on the roof type stuff. 
they mix that with charismania. Now, I, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You know I do. So does Yossi. But the extremism, we call it the hakitsonim, we don't believe that. These people mix these two things, and they're all over the place. There's a group of them that Yossi will maybe mention that are wrecking havoc in Israel right now. And they get into serious doctrinal error. Most of them come from America, but not all of them. But most of them come from the States. So do most of the good ones, by the way. But most of the bad ones come from the States. You had a brilliant Jewish scholar who translated the New Testament into Hebrew called Franz Delich. David Barron, Alfred Edersheim, they were the pioneers. And it comes forward to the present day, there are good, serious, messianic Jewish scholars. But then you've got these frauds. <laughs> you've got the frauds among the unbelieving Jewish rabbis, and you have the frauds among the leaders of the messianic movement. You've got the good ones, and you've got the bad ones. Too often, well-intentioned Christians who love Israel and the Jews will respond to anything that comes in the name of Israel or messianic. They'll just think it must be. They see what's wrong with the Gentile church, by and large. They know we live in an age of, apo of, of apostasy and things like this. They've seen all the, the crazy things. And so they say, well, we have to get back to the New Testament Christianity. Let's see. Oh, it was Jewish. <laughs> but they're not going back to Jewish theology. <laughs> they're trying to go back to Jewish culture. 1 Corinthians 7 says, keep your own culture. Jews should not seek to become non-Jews. Keep your own culture. But the theology of the original Jewish church was the right one. It was for everybody. We see it explained most clearly in the epistle to the Hebrews. Now, even at that early point, there were Jewish believers going off in Israel before the temple was destroyed, which is the primary purpose of the Sittim of the historical setting why Hebrews was written. It has meaning for us now, it has meaning for believers for all ages, but it, it was prompted by things that were going wrong in Israel and in Jerusalem around 60 to 70 A.D. Understanding the Jewish gospel, it's got to come full circle. We have to go back to understand the gospel the way the early Jewish church did. The oldest book of the New Testament, the first one written, most scholars agree, is the Epistle of James. Mark is almost certainly the oldest gospel, but the Epistle of James is, without any real question, the first book of the New Testament. And it refers to the church as a synagogue in the original Greek. It, calls the church a it was obviously written to, Jew to, to believing Jews. Full circle. How did they understand the gospel? Was it different? There's only one gospel, really. It has different characters. There's different emphasis of it. There's the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of peace, the gospel of salvation. Paul personalizes it. But it's all the same message presented with different emphases. How did the early Jewish Christians understand the gospel? And what does the body of Christ need to get back to today? Both Jew and Gentile. How they understood it. This is not a new teaching. It's an old one. It's what the first believers believed. Let's begin by looking, if you will please, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 18. Verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, now, it emphasizes he was an Alexandrian. We have to understand something. Alexandria was the intellectual capital of the Levant. 
It would be like saying Oxford or Cambridge then. It was also the place of transmission of Eastern religious and philosophical influences into Judaism and later Christianity with the post-Nicene Church Fathers, particularly people like Oregon and Clement of Alexandria, later Basilides, Valentinus, that was the Christian. But it begins with Eastern influences coming into Judaism with someone called Philo. Philo. Around the, around the time of Jesus. So he's from Alexandria. That would be like saying he was from Oxford or from Cambridge. By birth. An eloquent man. Eloquence here has the idea of not simply being articulate but educated in his speech. He came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. We must at all costs avoid two mistakes. One mistake is, if someone is not eloquent, to dismiss what they say because they don't sound educated. The other is, that ignorant mentality that says you don't need that Bible college boy you just need Jesus the Apostles didn't go to no university no, Paul did Apollos did <laughs> Barnabas did they were educated men notice the second generation of leaders in the early church were more educated than the first notice that the second generation of leaders in the early church were more educated than the first. Peter acknowledges this in his epistle. He says, let Paul explain the complicated things, doesn't he? Our brother Paul, given this grace, he's a rabbi, he's from the school of Gamaliel. The second generation were more formally educated than the first. Now Peter wrote two epistles that are of co-equal authority with anything Paul wrote. But look what Paul wrote. Where much is given, much is expected. We cannot make education and eloquence a standard for someone being qualified for ministry or even leadership. On the other hand, we cannot dismiss its practical value. Neither is correct. We have this scripture in the English language because of educated men like John Wycliffe and William Tyndale. These were educated men. These early messianic scholars, like Alfred Edersheim and Franz Delitzsch, these were educated men. Paul could debate rabbis, he could debate Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, because he was an educated man. God used Paul to do that. Barnabas, Apollos, many people, including Luther, have believed that Polis was the author of Hebrews. Can't prove it, but it is a theory. So he's from Alexandria, an eloquent man who came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the scripture. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Yeshua, Jesus. Being acquainted only with the baptism of John, Yohanan Hamadibil, John the Baptist. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Now notice there was nothing wrong with what he believed. He was accurate in what he was saying. It was all doctrinally, theologically, and historically correct. Everything he was saying was correct. But it was not complete. He said nothing wrong. But there was more to it that he did not at that point realize, let's continue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public. Now, Jews in this context, of course, means the religious establishment. It doesn't mean people who are ethnically Jewish. He was Jewish. (laughs) 
it is like today. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, they thought of themselves as the proper Jews. We're the real Jews. The others are the Am Ha'aretz. They looked down on them, especially if they were Galileans. Okay. They looked down on the others. We're the proper, you know, we're the real Jews. This happened in the 1700s when the Hasidic movement began. After the false messiahs, Jacob Frank and Shabbat Taisvi had been proclaimed, there was a stoic reaction in Judaism, and it became a religion of the yeshiva that only wealthy Jews could send their sons to. The ordinary Jews of the shtetl were, as it were, disenfranchised from Jewish learning. And, and this is where the Hasidic movement came into. It went to these poor people with mysticism and Gnosticism. Alexandria was a place where Gnosticism strongly invaded Judaism and later Christianity, beginning with Philo, ending with Basilides and Valentinus in the Christian era, after Nicaea. Only mention these historical details in passing. Now notice, because of his learning and education, remember what Jesus said. He said, when a scribe becomes a disciple, he brings out of the treasury things old and things new. The theologians of the day were the sofrim, the scribes. Ironically, it came from the Hebrew word lispor, to count. They had a numerical value, alphanumeric system, they had a numerical value to the letters. And knowing the mathematical value of every verse of every book is how they guaranteed accuracy in transmission. They could just count it up. But this also figured hermeneutically in their translation with something called gematria. Gematria. Later corrupted by Kabbalah into mysticism and numerology. But originally it was just gematria. You see gematria in Matthew's, Matthew's Gospel. Where the numbers of letters tell you something about the theological theme of it. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? Does anybody want me to explain it? You all know what Gematria is. Who wants me to explain it? Why didn't you say so? <laughs> My apologies to the rest of you. We're going to count in Hebrew. We're going to count the letters. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. Achad, Shtaim, Shalosh, Arba. Da. Four. Aleph, Shtaim, Gimel, Dalet. Hey, Vav. Six. Dalit. Four. Fourteen. David. Daud. David. You understand? Hence, Matthew breaks up the genealogy into sections of fourteen, doesn't he? He's using mathematics to illustrate the theological theme of the text. David's name, that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. This is called gematria. There was also a version in Greek. It's important to understand this, to understand 666, the number of the beast, but I'm not going there now. <laughs> Unfortunately, the rabbis corrupted this later with Kabbalah, with numerical mysticism. But gematria is scriptural. They used numeric acrostics, like Psalm 119. <laughs> Olive, Beth, Gimel, you know. The A is for apple, B is for boy, C is for cat, like that. That's how they did it. You know, D is for door, that's how they did it. The first letter of the first word. In the Torah, the first word of a book determines its name. It's not Genesis, it's Breshit in the beginning, because that's the first word. Okay. Exodus. It's not the Exodus. It's the book of names. Shemot, because that's the first word in the text. Okay. 
Leviticus, Ve'yikra, and Yahweh called her, and God called. You know, it's the first word. That's how they structured it. There was a literary numerical structure to the Hebrew canon that influenced the New Testament and the Septuagint. It influenced the New Testament via the Septuagint, but again, I don't want to get too academic. Okay, so, you got this guy, and he's a learned man. These were the scribes. They were experts in the text because they understood acrostics, gematria, and they understood how to use mathematics to guarantee when the scrolls, the Megilot, were copied, there'd be no mistakes. Remember Jeremiah 36? He, they took the scribe's knife and cut the scroll up. We don't agree with that bit. We're going to cut it out. <laughs> well, the scribe's knife, the so free when they would copy scrolls, if, there was a, if it didn't add up mathematically, they'd know the mistake. So they would literally use the knife and cut that out of the scroll and patch it. They did it with papyrus and things like this. It was a whole art as well as a mathematical science. That's how they gave us the word of God without mistakes. Okay. They used mathematics and acrostics. They were experts in the text. When a scribe becomes a disciple, he brings things out of the treasury, old and new. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Yeah, Jesus did say that. Unsaved theologians are terrible people. All head knowledge, and they're on their way to the lake of fire unless they repent and believe. On the other hand, if one of them does believe, they're going to bring out of the treasury of God's word things old that the early Christians knew or the ancient Hebrews knew, and things new, not new doctrine, but a revelation of things that are already in there. Remember, Daniel sealed this up to the appointed time. The appointed time, they're going to see it. This will require scribes who get saved. People who are educated in biblical languages and so forth, who are textual experts. Thank God for William Tyndale. <laughs> Thank God for John Wycliffe. Long before the Reformation, there were believers in England preaching the truth. Terribly persecuted, the low lords, but it was because of Wycliffe. Was Wycliffe from Yorkshire? Was he an educated man? Of course he was. He was one of the most educated men in England. That's one of the reasons they hated him so much. He was no dope. Apollos is like that. When you had people like Apollos and Paul and Barnabas running around, the Sanhedrin would pull their hair out. Well, here comes Priscilla. And along with Priscilla, Aquila. As we always point out, wherever there is a Priscilla, there is an Aquila. Leadership is always male. If there is an Esther, there is a Mordechai. If there is a Deborah or a Yael, there is a Barak. Leadership is male. Can God use women? Yes, with their head covered. He does not circumvent his order of authority. This Joyce Meyer thing is not scriptural. The Jan Markell thing is not scriptural. It's just not scriptural. It's not of God. Where there's an Esther, there's a Mordecai. Where there's a Deborah, there's a Barak. Where there's a Priscilla, there's an Aquila. And where there is a Jezebel, there is an Ahab. She's wearing the trousers, he's wearing the skirt. <laughs> Women with the Jezebel spirit only like men who pander to them. They hate the other ones. Feminism is not a phenomenon of the 1970s. It, it existed long before that. <laughs> and it inevitably will lead to false, false belief. False worship, false religion, as with Jezebel and Ahab. But 
Again, I only mention that in passing. So Priscilla and Aquila come along, and they say, look, we found this Jewish guy, and he's a smart guy. He's well-educated. He's from Alexandria. He's Oxbridge. He's Ivy League. He believes with passion. But, but he only understood what John the Baptist said about Yeshua. He didn't really understand the rest of it. There was nothing wrong with what he said. The problem is with what he did not say. What he was teaching and preaching were accurate. He couldn't fault it. But where's the rest of it? It's the same today. I don't mean this arrogantly. I'm not claiming a new revelation. I'm not a Gnostic. I'm simply saying, when we look carefully at the epistle to the Hebrews, and we read the Gospels in light of Hebrews and other books, particularly 1 Corinthians, we see that the early Jewish Christians saw the Gospel with a totality that goes beyond the way most believers, Jew and Gentile, think today. I want to look at three questions. One is why in his death and resurrection does Jesus fulfill not one holy day, not just Passover, but he partially fulfills Yom Kippur. Second question. Why do we take the Lord's Supper with both bread and with wine? The Roman Catholic Church does not. Why do we take the Lord's Supper with both bread and wine? Why is, why is that? Well, let's look at these things. On YouTube, a question was addressed to the American Baptist, radical cessationist, who unfortunately teaches it's going to be possible to take the mark of the beast, sell your soul to Satan, and worship the Antichrist, and still be born again. I speak of John MacArthur. And John MacArthur says, we're saved by his death, we're saved by his blood. It means the same thing. It was a slaughterhouse religion. We're saved by his death and by his blood. They have this, we're saved by the blood, we're saved by the death. It means the same. Death equals blood. No, it does not. The life is in the blood, not the death. He is fundamentally misguided in his thinking of the gospel. The early Christians would not have said anything like that, certainly not the Jewish ones. Now let me continue. Does anyone not understand how Jesus primarily fulfills the spring holy days of Israel in his first coming and primarily fills the autumn holy days in his second? Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? Please tell me if you don't. That he fulfills the meaning, he's the messianic fulfillment of Passover, of the Feast of First Fruit and of Pentecost in his first coming, and he's the messianic fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Truah, which they now call Rosh Hashanah, of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and of uh, Hag Sukkot, of, of uh, Feast of Booths, in his second coming. The spring holidays he fulfills in his first coming, primarily, and the autumn holy days in his second. Does anybody not understand this? Please tell me if you don't understand this. Put your hand up so I can... Uh, is there many of you? Okay, very, very briefly. 
God gave Israel a calendar in Leviticus 23 and 24 for three reasons. One, it was a polemic against paganism. The Canaanites were giving thanks to Baal and to other gods for the rain and the sun and the harvest. It was a polemic against them. Yahweh, Hashem, wanted the Jews to thank him for those things. Secondly, it was a memorial of the things he did for them in the past, like saving them out of Egypt and providing for them in the wilderness. He wanted the Hebrews to remember what he already did for them as a way to engender faith to trust him for the present and the future. Always remember the needs God has already met in our lives, beginning with salvation. It will give us faith to remember what he's going to do. This is a major aspect of the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance. Jesus being our Passover. Third, it's a picture of what theologians call Heilsgeschichte, salvation history. In his first coming, the Feast of Israel, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Agnus Dei Quitoris Pecatamundi, as the Catholics say. Everybody understand he's the lamb without blemish. The God, one without sin, is worth all the men with sin. That's how one could die for all. He raises from the dead in Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. First fruit. He is the first fruit. The high priest goes into the Kidron at sunrise when it's still dark. In a ceremony, he waits for the first pin of light to come up on back of the Mount of Olives. How does I a team? And when he sees the first pin of light, he ceremonially harvests the first stalk coming out of the earth. Called the first fruit. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Yeshua, Jesus, is the first fruit. The very hour of the very day, the very moment, the high priest was sacrificing the first fruit, Yeshua was raising from the dead. All four Gospels say it was still dark on the first day of the week. They have the whole truth in front of them, and they don't see it, except for the believers. The Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's poured out. This is a civil calendar. It is actually mainly lunar, solar lunar, but mainly lunar. And it's a civil calendar. It's a religious calendar, but it also is an agricultural calendar. It follows the agricultural cycle. You've got a rain in the spring giving a harvest and a rain in the autumn. Isaiah 44.3, I will pour out the rain, I will pour out my spirit. The outpouring of the rain is a picture of the pouring out of the spirit. It gives the harvest. Again, I know most of you know this. The rabbis calculate that the Torah was given on Pentecost. Only when the law was given, 3,000 fell. Remember? 3,000 were given. When the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. Not only that, but it says in the Mishnah, the Mishnah, that when the Torah was given, a whirlwind came from heaven. And based on the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, 70 languages were heard, 70 tongues were heard when the Torah was given. This is in the Mishnah. And so on Pentecost, they hear the phenomena of, of tongues. To the Jews, would have been a sign. Long, hot summer, no rain, at least not in Israel. This corresponds to the time of the Gentiles. Overlapping, but not the same as the age of the church. Overlapping, but not the same as the age of the church. In his first coming, Jesus fulfills these three. They have a partial refulfillment in his second coming, but we won't go there now. Then comes trumpets which the rabbis changed the Happy New Year. When you read 
the Tanakh, the Old Testament, it does not mean Happy New Year. It means Oy Vavoy, the congregation of Israel for the time of Jacob's trouble. We have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And we have the Feast of Booths. Ag Sukkot. Pay attention. Yom Kippur. The high priest would have two goats, identical in age, appearance. They had to look the same, had to be the same age, the same weight. By lot, he would choose one for the Lord, and the other would be the Sa'ed Ezazel. Ezazel was an idiom for the devil. He'd lay hands on these goats, imparting the sin of the people onto the goats. They would take the goats through the streets of Jerusalem in a procession, like a parade, and spit on them and kick them. They would hit them with sticks and throw stones at them, cursing them for their sin. A picture of the Via Dolorosa, isn't it? The crucifixion of Christ when the Romans killed them, parading, carrying the cross. One goat would die, one would be left free, except it was freedom was temporary. It would be taken a distance of 90 stadia, a fair distance outside of Jerusalem, into the wilderness. The one that was for the Lord would be sacrificed in, in Jerusalem, okay, in the temple. The high priest would take its blood, and once a year, he'd go on back of the temple, the vilon, the curtain in the temple to the Holy of Holies once a year to make atonement. Once a year. That's what John the Baptist's father was doing in Luke's Gospel when John was born. His father was the high priest. The other would be taken into the wilderness. The high priest had special vestments. He wore once a year. He'd take a scarlet sash around his waist, cut it in half. One, he would hang before the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies. The other, he would tie to the horns of the goat, okay. between the two horns. Now, it's not one place in the Mishnah. You have to put two, actually three places in the Mishnah together to get this. But it says if the sins of the people were forgiven, it would turn white, based on Isaiah 118. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Again, it's not one passage that says this. You've got to put together two, actually three passages from the Mishnah to get this. If the people's sins were not forgiven, it would not turn white. And for 40 years before the temple was destroyed. In other words, from 70 AD, counting backwards to the time of Jesus, the sins of, the, of Israel were never forgiven again by the law, by Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur comes from the word kapora. The mercy seat is kaporet, kaporet. It kind of means to cover, to cover, like a cover note. Before you get your insurance policy for your car, you're allowed to drive it as long as they email you a cover note temporarily until the proper one arrives in the mail. It's a temporary provision. If the sins of Israel, before the Messiah came, if a Jew really repented, they had sincere repentance and faith. The blood of the goat would cover, would make kapara, would cover their sin until the Messiah came and removed it. This kind of sacrifice was known as a korban. Korban. Remember Jesus rebuked the, the, the Pharisees saying anything that can be given to my parents is korban? This is Yom Kippur. The other goat was taken out to a cliff, and they would push it backward off the cliff and kill it. This, the Ezazel. Now pay attention. <laughs> this is a little bit difficult to explain. One goat had to die in Jerusalem. The other goat had to die outside of Jerusalem by being pushed off a cliff. We have something you read about in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In Hebrew, it will be called Haparak HaShavua, the portion of the week. 
the section of the Torah and the Haftorah, the Law and the Prophets, that would be read ritually in an annual lection. An annual lection. After the time of Tisha B'Av, roughly the end of the summer, uh, mid-August, when the, both temples were destroyed, up into the High Holy Days, the focus of the Jews was increasingly on Yom Kippur, on getting rid of their sin. Everything began focused on Yom Kippur after Tisha B'Av, up until Yom It still is with the ultra-Orthodox. We know from what Yeshua was reading in the synagogue, what time of year it was, in Nazareth. He was reading from Isaiah. Now he cuts the verse in half, doesn't he? Again, I know most of you know this. Look at Luke, look at Luke 4 very quickly. Verse 17, and the book actually would have been a scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed him. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight of the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and all the eyes were fixed on him. And he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, and they try to throw him off a cliff. Why are they looking at him? Well, let's look at what he was reading in Isaiah, Ishayahu. Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, bisora, gospel, evangelion in Greek, to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now this relates to something called Hashanah HaYovel, the year of Jubilees, but again I won't go there now. Let's look at it. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. He doesn't read the end of the verse. He cuts the verse in half. He didn't come to bring vengeance in his first coming. That's in his second coming. That's Hamashiach ben David, not Hamashiach ben Yosef. In his first coming, he comes in the character of Joseph, a suffering servant. In his second coming, in the character of David. You understand, he only read half the verse. He sits down and the people, well, where's the rest of it? Why didn't you read the whole thing? Now they're freaked out. So they decide to do the only thing that made any sense to them. They tried to throw him off the cliff. Not far from where Yossi, it's about 20 minutes drive from where Yossi lives. About 20 minutes drive from where he lives, if the traffic is all right. About 20 minutes from where he lives. And he evades them. By supernatural intervention, he evades them. They couldn't throw him off the cliff. Why? They had the wrong goat. You understand? He was the other goat. He was the one that was for the Lord. He doesn't die thrown off a cliff outside of Jerusalem. He dies in Jerusalem. On Yom Kippur. It wasn't Yom Kippur. It wasn't Jerusalem. He doesn't go off a cliff. Everybody understand? In between trumpets and Yom Kippur, you have something called Hayamim Hanoraim, the days of awe, the terrible days. These represent the peak of the time of Jacob's trouble at the end. Just before Yeshua comes back, Satan is going to try to eradicate the Jews completely, worse than Hitler, just as he tried to eradicate the church before the rapture. That 10-day period in the autumn corresponds to the period between the Ascension and Pentecost, 
Remember, it was the 40th day he ascended, but the 50th day was Pentecost. You got a 10-day period here in the spring and a corresponding 10-day period here in the autumn. You understand? It follows the same pattern. Again, we have other teachings on the internet. You can watch it. Then comes Booths. We have a partial fulfillment of Booths in John 7. But we know in Zechariah 14, the meaning of the Feast of Booths is the Millennial Kingdom. When he sets up the Messianic Kingdom, r ruling from the, house of, uh, the throne of David. That still has to happen. So, in his first coming, you have a primary fulfillment of the spring holy days. But we only have a partial fulfillment of the autumn holy days. Trumpets has to do with being near a water gate. If you read Nehemiah chapter 8, it is probably, almost certainly, in John 5, at the pool of Bethesda, where it says it was a feast of the Jews, that was almost certainly Rosh Hashanah. Okay, trumpets, Yom Tzadra. Yom Kippur, boots. Everybody understand? So, when he dies on the cross, he's both the lamb and the goat. But only one goat has died. The other goat still has to die. Who's the other goat? Satan, the Azazel. When Jesus comes back, Satan is destroyed. You understand? <laughs> Everybody understand? Again, there's more to it. I'm just touching on it because there are a few people who didn't know this stuff. Most of you are familiar with it. Let's look now. The Gentile church, since the Reformation, has had an understanding of the gospel based on the Vulgate, the Latin scriptures, called the five solas. There's more than five, but there's five major ones. Sola meaning only. Okay. And it was largely a reaction against the false gospel, the corruption and idolatry and necromancy of Roman Catholicism. The reformers having been Roman Catholic priests from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy who learned from humanist scholarship led by Erasmus and people like that, that Rome had a false gospel. It was sola scriptura. Only the Word of God! All right. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, the High Anglican Church, they can only exist by doing what Jesus condemned the Sanhedrin for doing to hell in Matthew 15, teaching us precepts of God, the commandments of men. Roman Catholicism can only exist by doing what Jesus told the Sanhedrin Sanhedrin, they were going to go to hell for if they didn't repent. Inventing doctrine. Sola Scriptura. Sola Fide. We have to have faith in Yeshua, in Jesus. He's our Savior. Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness, relating to what Yossi shared earlier. It's only by faith in what he did. We don't do good works to get saved. We do good works because we've been saved. It's what he did that we have faith in. It's him. Okay. Solo gracia. Only by grace. We don't deserve to be saved. It's God's love, God's mercy. He condemned his son in our place. Remember, it was Leviticus uh, 26, you'll eat your sons? <laughs> no, no, no. Kill, kill me, you know, it's going to be my son. This is my body. It's, you understand, Jesus became the curse of the law. He took the curse of the Torah on himself so Israel would be saved. 
he took the curse of the law. So the grazie, it's all grace. Sola Christe, only Christ, only the Messiah, that's it. And it's only for the glory of God, as Bach used to sign his musical compositions. Sola Gloria Deo. These are the five main solas. There are others. Western evangelicism, since the Reformation, maybe even before, but certainly documented and defined it this way since the Reformation, that is our understanding of the gospel. Saved by grace through faith. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Grazia, Sola Christe, Sola Gloria Deo. Is it true? Every word of it's true. Is it accurate? It's all accurate. Is it complete? No. Where is the rest of it? If you showed this stuff to a Jewish believer in the first century, he would have said, yeah, of course, we know that. That's right. Sola Scriptura, absolutely. Yeshua condemned the Sanhedrin for inventing doctrine, teaching his precepts of God, the invention of men. Sola fide, yes. Abraham believed and it was counted as righteousness. It's faith. Faith in who? Faith in the Messiah. Sola Christe. All grace, chesed, Sola gracia. All to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Yeah, we believe all that. There's nothing wrong with what you're saying. We agree with that. But where's the rest of it? <laughs> you got that bit right, but where is the rest of it? What they don't understand is the Jewishness of the gospel. <laughs> Remember, he's both the Paschal Lamb and the Goat. First Corinthians. Think of the epistles, as you know, as inspired commentary. They explain the Gospels. We read the Gospels through the prism of the epistles. We read scriptures through the prism of the epistles. 1 Corinthians explains Passover. It's the most paschal of the epistles. 1 Corinthians, chapters 5, 6, chapters 11, it's the most paschal of the epistles. It explains Jesus as the Passover lamb and so forth. Hebrews explains Jesus as the goat. It explains Yom Kippur. We can think of Hebrews as a messianic commentary, inspired commentary, God's word, on Leviticus. Okay? On Leviticus. So there's two aspects of what Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection. There is the Paschal and there is the Haporic. They relate, but they are not the same. There is the Paschal aspect and the Kaporic aspect, as the early Christians would have understood it. In the Paschal, we're concerned with Jesus fulfilling Passover. 
In the Kaporic, we are concerned with Jesus fulfilling the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. In the Paschal, it's Jesus as the spotless lamb. But in the Kaporic, it's Jesus as the goat. When Jesus dies on the cross, he was our high priest making blood atonement for our sin on the altar, wasn't he? But Pilate puts up a sign that says, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. Yeshua HaMashiach, Amelike Yehudim. Remember, only the Messiah could be both king and priest. One had to be a descendant of Aaron, the other of David, one of the tribe of Judah, the other of Levi. In the Paschal, and in the Kaporic, king of the Jews, it is the royal death. The death of the king. The Jews. In the Kaporic, it is the priestly death. Remember the cities of refuge where a Jew guilty of inadvertent sin would have refuge if he killed somebody without premeditation. He would be temporarily protected in the city of refuge until the high priest died. Then he would be free. You understand? These cities of refuge were pictures of the bosom of Abraham, where faithful Jews under the law would be until the high priest came and died, until the Messiah died. Then they could enter paradise. They were waiting in Sheol for the Mashiach. Everybody understand? The whole law is a picture of the Messiah. Let's look at Hebrews. Chapter 9, verse 16, for where a covenant is, where there's a Brit, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. It's never in force while the one who made it lives. What's that talking about? The high priest had to die. The law teaches about our fallen nature. The Torah demonstrates through the example of Israel and the Jews that we cannot meet God's standard. Only the Messiah can and did. How do we get off the hook? I don't have to keep that agreement anymore. My partner in the agreement, who I made the agreement with, he's dead. You understand? So in Passover, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, we have the royal or the Davidic aspect of salvation. 
in the Kaporic, we have the priestly or the Aaronic aspect. Everybody understand? He's both king and priest. Let's go a bit further with this. Look with me to Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced through for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. Madka in Hebrew. He was injured on our behalf. The judgment for our sin came on him. This is again Korbanik. He takes the blame for what we did. It's Korbanik. Judgment. But Korbanik does not equal. Kaporic. When he introduced the Lord's Supper, it was a Paschal Seder. It was an ancient Near Eastern suzerainty ritual. It was the New Covenant. Right? First comes the body. This is my body. Then, the blood, the wine. Akos azot hi abrita hadasha ze dami shimeshpach badem. The Paschal has to do with the body. The Kaporic has to do with the blood. Let's look. The wrath of God. Is the Paschal. It is. Death. Haronia, the wrath of God. It is death. The kaporic to make atonement. Kapora is not the wrath of God. It's the forgiveness. He sees the blood. It is life. The life is in the blood. The paschal aspect of the crucifixion is about death. The kaporic is about life. The paschal is about God's wrath. The kaporic is about God's forgiveness. The paschal is about the body. The kaporic, as we'll come to in a moment, the blood. The paschal is korbanic. The kaporic is kaporic. The Paschal is royal or Davidic. The Kaporic is priestly or Aaronic. The lamb and the goat fulfills Passover, fulfills Yom Kippur.
Look with me, please. Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement. Not for your sin, but mafshatchem, for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Dying for our sin is paying the price. That's the korbanic. It does not equal atonement. Atonement is being forgiven. The reason he can forgive is because he is paid. You understand? Unless he died, the blood would not avail. He first had to take the blame for what we did. Die in our place Physically, death before the blood could give the life. Only after the goat was sacrificed on Yom Kippur, once the goat was dead, the high priest would take the blood into the Holy of Holies. Notice the blood would only come into play after the death. He had to die before the blood would do any good. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19. Verse 32, the soldiers, the Roman legionaries, came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him, with Jesus. But coming to Yeshua, when they saw he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. As he was seen, he testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows he's telling the truth, so that you also may believe. The viscosity of blood is denser than the viscosity of water. It should have been the water that came out first. Physiologically, metabolically. Instead, it was the blood. It was physiologically miraculous. When the first time for the De when the Dead Sea Scrolls were investigated for the first time, I was a much younger believer. I read a book about the research into the Dead Sea, I'm uh, not the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the uh, Shroud of Turin, the Shroud of Turin. Could this be authentic or not? And in Britain, the, most of the research had to do with, actually, and this was a long, in the 70s they did this, what can they do now? Trying to trace the genetic constituency of pollen, could it be from the Middle East at that time? Pollen, residual pollen found in the fabric. That's what was done in Britain. The Italians did the historical research on the shroud and its history. The Americans, NASA, did the physics, I guess you say. Is the, sh is the shroud a photographic negative and things like that? How was the image made? in terms of the photophysics. The French, however, did the medical aspects. They kept 
cadavers, corpses metabolizing on life support machines, and then they crucified the cadavers Roman style. Then they did postmortems, they did autopsies on the cadavers to try to determine what Jesus died of. And he died of a combination of internal hemorrhage and hypovolemic shock, as well as pericardial effusion. That was their medical determination. It stands why this would shoot out of his side, because you have the lividity factor into the lower torso. It makes subthoracic thoracic lividity. It makes sense, except it doesn't make sense why the water didn't come first. But let's look. Notice he had to be dead. He was already dead before the blood came out. He already paid for what we did. Then comes the blood. The Roman legionnaire in the Synoptic Gospel says, the Roman commander, surely this was the Son of God. Let's look again at Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 9, it gives an explanation of Jesus as the Yom Kippur Kippurah. The Holy Spirit is signifying this in verse 8, that the way into the holy place was not yet disclosed while the outer tabernacle was standing. Remember what Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up? His outer tabernacle, he spoke of his body as the temple, it could not be standing. The way into the Holy of Holies could not exist until he was dead. You understand, the temple had to be destroyed. He had to be dead. He had to pay for our sins. The high priest had to die to bring the captives freedom. Only after he paid for what we did could he make atonement. In the crucifixion, do not confuse the body and the blood. One is paying the price for what we did. The sentence was death. The other is forgiveness, imputed righteousness, life. The life is in the blood. We can go on like this. Let's look at Romans 5 very briefly, verse 11. There are many verses speaking about blood atonement. Not only this, but we exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. We are reconciled because of the atonement. But the atonement could not happen. When he entered the Holy of Holies to make atonement, the sacrifice already had to be dead. You understand? The Levite had to kill the goat before the high priest could bring the blood into the Holy of Holies. It didn't work unless the sacrifice was dead. Unless the korban was dead, the blood would not give life. Atonement is to do with reconciliation. <laughs> not crucifixion itself, but the result of it. And he gives the Lord's Supper. And he says, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Akosazotia Brit Hadasha. 
But on the cross, before he died, he says, It is finished. Paid in full to Telestai. Don't believe Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Meyer. It was paid in full. He fulfilled the Torah that no Jew and no man could ever keep. In the Paschal, he fulfills the old covenant. In the Kaporic, this is the cup of the new covenant. He inaugurates the new covenant. You understand? Oops. So we have the Paschal and the Kaporic, the Passover and Yom Kippur, the lamb and the goat the royal and the priestly, the kabonic and the kaporic, the body and the blood, the wrath, the forgiveness, the death, the life, the fulfillment of Torah, of the old covenant, the inauguration of the new. Don't confuse Passover with Yom Kippur. Don't confuse the crucifixion of his body with the shedding of his blood. He was our high priest who entered the Holy of Holies in eternity, of which the earthly one was a mere copy, after he was dead and paid the price. The death of his body does not equal his blood. Not the same. It's one of the, one of several key areas, and again, I don't say this by way of attack, simply by way of fact. It's one of the key areas where John MacArthur is fundamentally wrong, and I dare say fundamentally ignorant. But so is most of the church. We're saved by his blood. We're saved by his death. He atoned on the cross. That doesn't mean he died on the cross. That was the destruction of his body. To pay the price, what we did. It was the death. The life is in the blood. Well, what about this other stuff? Do I believe in Sola Scriptura? Absolutely. Completely true. Do I believe in Sola Fide? Absolutely. Completely true. Do I believe in Sola Grazia? Absolutely. Completely true. Sola Christa? Of course. Actually, it could be Sola Christa. Sola Gloria Deo? No question. Of course I believe in the solas. What you say is right. It's all accurate. It's all completely correct. But where is the rest of it? There was nothing wrong with what Apollos said. The problem is what he didn't. There is nothing wrong with the Western evangelical Gentile understanding of the gospel. There's nothing wrong with it. But where is the rest of it? The Paschal and the Kaporic. Thank you for listening. God bless.